Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table. We discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director for Cultural Engagement at the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary in Dallas, Texas. And you can see I am surrounded. <laughs> um, friends. <laughs> yes, friends. Very good. Yeah, well, that's, a, that's great. <laughs> Hopefully it remains that way. Anyway, um, and our topic today is feminism and womanism, what is the difference? And I'm going to take a little bit of time to kind of set the stage here because this is actually for us a very important conversation. One of the things we do at the center is we try and um, – prepare people and equip people with regard to difficult conversations in our complex world, by which we mean our pluralistic world. And probably the most, um, one of the most challenging areas of that conversation for the church in the last really half century, if not longer, has been, has been the area of um, the way in which women have become more and more involved in our society and in some cases uh, more vocal in our society. Uh, and at this point, we're not trying to portray that as good or bad. It's just the reality. And so dealing with pluralism means understanding who your neighbor is, uh, particularly neighbors who think very, in some cases very differently than you do. So we spent a few years ago an entire year reading in this area of feminist studies, and what we thought was one thing and had always been one thing became many things with many different angles and parts to it. Uh, it was eye-opening, to say the least. And, and so we want to reflect some of that discussion in the conversations that we have today uh, and help people kind of get acquainted with the complexities of the conversation that exi- as it exists today. So I have three wonderful guests uh, with me today. Uh, Christina Crenshaw is an associate at the Hendricks Center and has worked with us on and off for several years now, uh, makes cameo appearances on the <laughs> podcast every now and then, and she's shown up for this one. Uh, and then uh, Cheyenne Coote, who is uh, office manager at the center, but did some study um, in your undergraduate in this area. T- tell us a little bit about that, and then I'll introduce Sandy. Yes. Sandra. <laughs> so when I was in college, I uh, minored um, in gender and women's studies, and so I took some classes, uh, black feminisms, um, contemporary feminisms, and wrote some papers on the depiction of, of, of black women in society. So this has always been kind of an interest of mine, both in my academic and personal life. Okay. Yeah. And then our, our third guest, who is uh, – you're such a veteran of these, I, I, I almost have to, have to not need to introduce you. Sandra Glahn, I'll put it, put, say it that way, uh, uh, professor of media arts here at the seminary and also has done a lot of work in, in this kind of an area. Talk a little bit about some of the work that you've done in this area. One of my uh, fields of my Ph.D. program was the history of ideas about gender, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which included, of course – feminism and womanism, but it was really going much further back to even the Roman Empire. Uh, Mm -hmm. What would it have been like in the context of Jesus and Paul, what's masculine there and feminine, and how much of a moving target is that? Okay. So so I talked about the last 50 years. You went to use the language (laughs) of that great theologian, Chris Berman, back, 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 back to the Roman Empire. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because, of course, way back to Aristotle and before that. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, Jesus, time of Jesus, that was yeah. even more recent. Right. So anyway, so, okay, so let's dive in. Let's start first with feminism, and um, Sandy has come prepared with a with a definition, so let's, let's hear it. So its foundation is the equality of the sexes, mm-hmm. and the ramifications then sociologically, politically, ideologically, and the movements that come out of that. Um, basically fighting sexism. Okay. So, well, well, maybe we ought to define sexism. Do you have a definition for sexism? Sure, it would be discrimination against women, mm-hmm. by, and not just men against women. Mm-hmm. It can be women against women. It's okay. anyone who's putting women down um, and uh, exercising ramifications that look uh, or are or look unequal or unfair. Okay, now most people think that there are – well, you, get, you gave some subcategories. Let me, let me go through that before I ask the next question. You said – and I don't think I remember them all – sociological, ideological, Logical, what was that, was that and list? And political. And political. Okay. 
So these, so there are different dimensions to these conversations that come in and that impact the way in which the topic is introduced and what's the concern. I mean, I, I take it the women's suffrage movement is is a part of this history. Sure, because rights voting is going to be political, but it's mm-hmm. also going to be ideological mm-hmm. right, and sociological. So it's not always clean categories. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so one way to think about this is there are some things that we – don't even blink at today that are a part of this right. history. That's that's mm-hmm. true. Mm-hmm. Custody mm-hmm. is uh, used to always go to the man, if, even if he was a heavy drinker and mm-hmm. was abusive. It was just assumed mm-hmm. goes to dad. Now we kind of swung the pendulum the other way, and sometimes fathers are having to fight for their rights because the court thinks of mothers as nurturing, and uh, mm-hmm. they might have to establish that that's not what's happening. Okay. So, okay. So that's that's uh, the, kind of the starting point for us now. Well, let me let me let's go do it this way. So, when I first heard about feminism, I thought it was one thing. Uh, it was um, uh, just it was feminism. It was it was women's rights and and that kind of thing. Uh, the right to work, the right to equal pl- pay. I can think about a lot of things that could go yeah. into the the sociological considerations of what this is involved. But actually, it's more complex than that, isn't it? It's like asking, what is an evangelical? Okay. <laughs> like, it's a very wide range. Okay. It has a lot of subsets. Okay. So let's walk through some of those because I, I understand, I'm, I, I feel like I'm going to be surfing because I'm going to be talking about waves. Yeah. But uh, there have been multiple waves in this, in this history. So, uh, uh, Christina, let's start with you. When did you first become aware of, um, of all this? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. So I want to just add first that I love the working definition that you just gave. And I would add one of the things that is of interest, particularly within our evangelical circles, is that it also encompasses our spiritual dimension as well. I think we've seen the past couple of years. But I first became aware of this conversation around feminism and womanism when I was actually only in the second grade. Of course, it was lost on me at the time, but my mom was earning her master's degree in women's literature at Texas Women's University. She was n- newly divorced and she needed child care for the day I was sick. So she pulled me out of my school because I couldn't go and she brought me to class with her. And the conversation for the day was on Alice Walker. And I remember being in second grade and listening to a room full of women discuss what it meant to really empower women. And of course, most of it was lost on me, but you know, retrospectively, I realized the, the larger, broader context and just even and the gravity of that moment, being with a single mother, listening to her struggle for her place at the table, struggle for women's rights, and having to bring her daughter to class with her. And it was it was this clash of beautiful and broken all at the same time. Hmm. But, um, you know, I would later go on in college to major in English, you know, master's degree, PhD. And so I would, of course, encounter feminism. But by that point, I was in the third wave. So we've actually had four waves of feminism. Okay. So I'll come back to that. I want to come back. and So tell us who Alice Walker is, because some people may not know. Okay. Well, she is part of third wave feminism, and I will let Cheyenne speak. Uh, she's kind of our resonance scholar here on, on Alice Walker. But um, there is first wave feminism, which really brought to the conversation a lot of what Sandra has highlighted. It was really a fight for um, a place with legality and voting and the ability to open a bank account or to, to have these parental rights, you know, many of those kinds of things. Second wave was a lot of conversation around um, things like reproductive rights. We, we saw a lot with Roe v. Wade. That was a big marker with, with second wave. Third wave feminism, which we had talked about before the podcast, is debatable. Is there a third wave? Is there a fourth wave? Are we in it? But third wave feminists would say that those were the ones who started to really ask the questions about what does work-life balance look like? What does it look like for, for women to enter the workforce, to have a seat at the table, um, to, to sort of shorten the the wage gap, so to speak. And fourth wave is a little bit more nebulous, I will agree, because we are currently in it, so it's hard to define what we are in. But, you know, fourth wave would be more of an online and more inclusive wave that you don't necessarily have to be a woman to be a feminist would be part of their argument. Alice Walker, um, I would say she was the mother of womanism. 
I don't know if you would agree with that, Cheyenne, but she is an author, a writer, a poet, a thinker. Um, and if we have time, let's circle back to her daughter who stood in contrast with her feminist mm-hmm. teachings. Her mm-hmm. daughter did. Yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So, so let's, let's talk about womanism. And in, in particular, as you went through the waves, it struck me that one of the things that you didn't mention that womanism supplies is particularly uh, – black perspective on the whole feminist movement. So let's talk about womanism, where it fits. Um, is it Does it belong in the waves, or is it alongside the waves? How should we think about what womanism is? Sure. So kind of piggybacking off of what Christina said, so Alice Walker in her book In Search of Our Mother's Gardens that she published in the late 80s, she coined the term womanism, which actually comes from the term womanish, which is an expression that some black people in the South might use to describe a little girl who's maybe acting older than her age, maybe a little bit more audacious, a little bit more outspoken. And she uses um, this quote to kind of contrast womanism to feminism. So she says, womanism is to feminism as purple is to lavender. And so even though she doesn't say it explicitly, I think Walker and implies that she thinks women, womanism is maybe a better way um, to capture the experiences of black women. And she does define um, a black feminist as someone who can identify as a womanist. Uh, I think she thinks that anyone who is a black woman can inherently identify as a womanist. Uh, but I think she does make it clear that womanism is an exclusive way for black women to define their lived experiences. And there are nuances to womanism that we'll get to later. Um, Clonora Hudson Weems, she um, coined the term Africana womanism. And then in the late 80s, uh, you have um, black Christian women who use the term womanism to talk about, uh, you know, reading um, the experiences of black women into the Bible. And so I definitely think that according to Alice Walker, um, womanism and black feminism can definitely be parallel. But I think she would say that womanism is a better or a more accurate way uh, to describe the experiences of black women. And I think um, part of that is because of some of the racial discrimination that has unfortunately been a part um, of the mainstream feminism movement and also some of the reticence um, or hesitation that some black women have towards feminism because of how they see it as something that's more antagonistic towards men. And I know some black women are more supportive of womanism because they feel like it's more community oriented, more family oriented. So there are multiple mm-hmm. levels of the critique that womanism is is issuing towards classic feminism Mm -hmm. in the midst of saying there are certain experiences that are particularly a part of the black community that feminism uh, didn't address and actually didn't pay attention to. In fact, uh, in the reading that I've done, there's a lot, there's a use of the term invisible, which I think is interesting, where it says black women are invisible in this conversation. Talk talk a little bit about that. Right. So kind of going a little bit into black feminism. So black feminist consciousness kind of became officially a thing in the 1970s. But when we bring it back to the mid 19th century, um, Sojourner Truth is Speech, um, and I a woman is kind of seminal um, to black feminist consciousness. And she's at a women's convention in Ohio. And she's talking about how as a black woman, um, in contrast to the experiences of a lot of her white counterparts, nobody helps her into carriages or over mud puddles. And her speech was huge because this was one of the first times, at least on a public platform, that a black woman was able to speak about her experiences um, as a black person and also as a woman. And historically, we see that struggle um, you know, in the mainstream feminist movement to prioritize or to really include the experiences, um, you know, of black women. And so to clarify, you know, black women have always been a part of the feminist movement. But going back to what you said, that term invisible, those experiences hasn't um, haven't always been validated. And so in the late 19th century, there are a lot of um, club organizations, National Council of Negro Women, National, National Association of Colored Women that were doing work, uh, you know, to help and, you know, improve the social political welfare of black women, but unfortunately, what they were doing wasn't always integrated or acknowledged in the mainstream feminist movement. And another another yeah. challenge that is a part of womanism and part of the black experience is there's not only a critique of feminism, but there's also a critique of the way in which black men and women have interacted with each other. Talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so kind of going off of what I was saying from before, so I think uh, – there are black women who may be hesitant to identify with feminism because 
um, it's antagonistic or maybe it puts down black men in a way that makes it hard for black women and black men to work side by side. And so I think uh, there are some black women who would support womanism because it's not necessarily, um, I guess, from their perspective, attacking black men, but more working with black men uh, to improve the welfare of black people as a whole. And so I think some people would see wom womanism as something that's more of black women and black men working together, that the liberation of that the liberation of black women is contingent upon the liberation of black people as a whole, that it's not something that's independent. And I think that's some of the issues that some black women may have with feminism. Okay, so we've used the term liberation. This mm -hmm. is going to be a, a challenging term, I think, for us. Yeah. But uh, let, let's think about that for a second. We're talking about liberation, and this is to any of you. Um, we're talking about liberation. We're really talking about, uh, about uh, people um, – uh, regaining a status they currently do not have. It's usually put in, a, in an oppression, oppressed op oppression uh, lens and the idea that there have been certain groups that have been limited in what they have done, been able to do historically and you're bringing them to a place of, of more equality. And now whether we're talking about race or we're talking about gender, that has been a part of both of these movements that have existed side by side. That's where they kind of cross and, and the two highways kind of get on the same on the same plane. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, the, the, the role in the picture of, of, of the term liberation in, in these movements because that certainly is also a part of the language that's going on. Sandy, you want to help us with that? So Christina made an important point that this has a spiritual element, mm -hmm. and so if you really want to trace the history, we can go all the way back to Genesis 3. Mm -hmm. And there is this conflict that's happening that is completely redeemable in mm -hmm. Christ, mm -hmm. but um, typically, particularly in agrarian societies, you have women getting pregnant, so they're completely vulnerable compared to a man who can go out and hunt. Mm -hmm. So that dependency includes an economic dependency, mm -hmm. which is why widows are so pitied mm -hmm. right through in the scriptures were called to care for those because in an agrarian context, uh, she is not liberated. Put right next sense. to widows and orphans. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so the liberation is saying there are ways through the laws, through the through social, there are things we can do to bring some equality to this situation. It's not just completely hopeless. And so for some, liberation is just an attitude, but for a lot, it's a concern for justice mm -hmm. and is an outworking of do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the challenge for us mm -hmm. as you talk about pluralism mm -hmm. is are you talking about a chip on your shoulder or mm -hmm. are you talking about really true injustices? Mm -hmm. um, you know, Cheyenne is talking about there are real injustices if you look at how we handled uh, the right to vote. vote. Mm -hmm. That was white women's mm -hmm. r right to vote, mm -hmm. largely, in that movement, right? Mm -hmm. And so then it raises a question of liberation, right? Mm -hmm. um, so liberation can be a bad word, but so can feminism, mm -hmm. but so, right? All and, and it a lot of times comes back to what do you mean when you say that? So the, and that? one of the reasons we spend a time spend some time on defining these terms is because what you mean and what yeah. you're communicating is actually pretty important. Yes. And a lot of people have defaults for some of these terms that may or may not reflect what the actual conversation is. I almost went into a university classroom and said I'm not a feminist, mm -hmm. and. I'm glad I didn't because after listening a while, I realized what they would have heard me say in that group would have been, I'm not for equal pay. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. That's not how I used it in most of my life. <laughs> so, we, so we've got this odd combination. I mean, we live in a fallen world. So we've got this odd combination, if I can say it this way, of the pursuit of, you know, everyone's made in the image of God. There's an inherent equality and inherent value that every human being has. That's regardless of race. Uh, but we also have this history that has that has divided us. That it, I, I once got in a discussion with a pastor who said, "Well, you know, uh, race is a social construct; it shouldn't be a part of this conversation." And I say, "The trouble is, is that no one no one lives that way. No one no one lives in a way in which." In which it, race is a non-factor, and so and there and there's a history that that has done 
that has involved wounding and damage and that kind of thing, which people are reacting out of. And sometimes we ignore that in the conversation. We make it a raw, abstract conversation. So I guess the question I have, and I'll direct this to you, Christina, is in thinking about the balance of being in a fallen world and in trying to say, all right, what is right? What should be just? I mean, God does care about justice. He's a God of justice. I was um, in a in a meditation over the Christmas season recently in which in which someone read out Isaiah um, 9, 6, a very well-known passage that gets read every Christmas. And for the first time, I, I'm so, you know, Prince of Peace, Mighty, uh, Everlasting God, Father, all, the, all those terms, uh, Mighty God. And for the first time, I noticed the term justice is in that description as mm -hmm. well. And I thought to myself, uh, that's interesting how I have missed that for so long. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. so... So in thinking about that, how do you how do we wrestle with the balance between the pursuit of justice and, and healthy relationships and living out the great commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, on the one hand, and the damage of, that our history has done on the other, which creates an alienation and a sense of, of being pressed down, if I can use that image, and yet at the same time, not doing it in such a way that it ends up being destructive and problematic for us in our in our relationships. That is such a broad question, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's encouraging to hear you say that um, that yes, there are times where you know we we read scripture and the Lord highlights different things, and and that's important to pay attention to what the Holy Spirit's doing there. I think to answer your question, I would um, dovetail that with what Sandra said earlier that the context and the definition is everything, and particularly for Christians, I think it goes back to being able to root you know the our, our beliefs in scripture. What are, what is our hermeneutics? What is our apologetics for that? How do we go back to the biblical narrative of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration? Because that is our touchstone, right? And so we want to be sure that we aren't just listening to the cultural narratives around feminism or womanism, that there are redemptive aspects of both of these ideologies mm -hmm. if rooted in Scripture, but apart from Scripture, they become part of the cultural narrative, and we know culture changes, culture is wrong, culture has fallen, right? And so I think that I can find things that that I appreciate about each wave of feminism that has been so very helpful for the church, for women. I can find things about womanism. You know, similarly, I am so thankful that womanism considers the larger social fabric of what it means to be a woman. Um, you know, part of why womanism was was birthed in the first place. Um, it seems like an apt analogy, birthing uh, womanism. Mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. part of the reason that was necessary was because feminism did um, give more critique, more consideration to elite women, women who were in academia, women who were in professional spaces. And it wasn't necessarily addressing um, the needs of women in a social context. Well, you know, what does it look like to fight for a seat at the CEO table if I can't even find childcare? Mm -hmm. Or what does it mean to, you know, lean in, as Sheryl Sandberg has famously coined, if I can't even, you know, get custody of my children, or if I, you know, race is a barrier. So I think to add, you know to answer the the broader question, it, it, for Christians it really looks like rooting what does the redemptive gospel narrative on this say? What do we know that God's heart is that you know that Jesus teaches us about how much God values women, how much you know the Lord values women, and then from there letting that be our guiding framework for what does it mean to care for the orphan, the widow, to care for the least of these, to look for ways to empower women, and so it really is, and and it's not just semantics; it's a heart mode. It's, it's our theology, it's our hermeneutics. What does it look like to lean into God's definition of justice so that we're empowering women from that space? Um, it becomes tricky when you're you know, engaging a pluralistic culture because they're not going to use the same language and the same terminology. But when we're inside the church, we need to make sure that we have a robust understanding for when we're engaging culture. So we are using the same words and definitions. So sometimes when I'm in this pluralistic space, I'll say to people, you have to distinguish between the, an, uh, an analysis of the problem and how we got to where we are and the way we think what the movement towards the solution is. And of course, the, the nature of where we are where we are is, is that there, there have been distinctions made. There have been groups that have formed some having sometimes advantage and others not. I mean, I, I think if we look at our history, that's hard to deny that that hasn't gone on. And so, uh, and, and so how do we come out of that? Out of that has come wounding. I think this is a very important. Out of that has come wounding that alienates people that has 
put a, if I can say it, a chip on their shoulder sometimes or a, or a tendency to want to think uh, tribally about the protection of their group because of what they've been through, that kind of thing. And then, uh, and then reactions come out of that space, and it becomes a competition for space. Um, a a zero-sum game that kind of says the only way I can gain is if you lose. And that's, that's the analysis place that puts us where we are and sometimes how that analysis takes place. But on the solution, the question is do you continue down that path with the assumption of a zero-sum game? Or do you think about is there a way to think about this space to where when one group gains, it actually benefits everybody? that they become more participatory, more present, more visible, more cared for, et cetera, et cetera. And um, my contention would be that what the gospel does in the midst of this is to say it creates a heart that says that's the goal, that, that, that we were created to cooperate with one another, male and female, made in the image of God. Uh, I like to joke with people that God didn't promote the creation from good to very good till the woman was put alongside <laughs> the man. So. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, and, and glad to oblige. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and and then we were created to to collaborate and work together in such a way that the creation hummed, the creation did well before God, and we were made to be stewards in this space. And so if we do that well and we work together, it's a cooperative r arrangement in which we recognize that each of us is bringing something to this conversation that everybody needs. And, and, and you do it out of, that, out of that restored, reconciled space, which is so important. And, the, and then the competition isn't that it it goes away. It doesn't. You still have to negotiate space and that kind of thing. But you do it with a different attitude uh, and, w and with a different approach. Uh, and so to me, when I'm thinking about how do I orient myself to this gospel story, that this theological story that's underneath the way Christians should be responding in this space, it isn't, it isn't to you know, put, plug my ears on the one hand. Nor is it to simply accept everything that's coming my way, but to actually parse out what's going on. So I'd like to do a little exercise, mm -hmm. and I know that uh, Cheyenne is ready to talk about this, uh, and let's do it from the, woman, from the womanism perspective. And the figure that I want to use as the model is Hagar. Yeah. So let's think about mm -hmm. what the story of Hagar is, because some people think the Bible is only about Abraham and Sarah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But there actually is this role for Hagar in Scripture that needs attention. And the interesting thing is, is that God also notices Hagar. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's go there. Yeah, so um, Dolores Williams, who is a womanist scholar in her book, um, Sisters in the Wilderness, she talks about uh, the story of Hagar in Genesis 16 being a really central narrative uh, to Christian womanist theology. And so I'm sure a lot of people listening already know the story. Um, but, you know, Sarah and Abraham were having a hard time conceiving. Sarah unwisely recommended that Abraham conceive a child um, with um, his mistress and when she did uh, Sarah mistreated her was jealous and Hagar ends up fleeing um, you know because of her mistreatment and while she's on the run um, an angel you know comes to her in the desert and basically encourages her um, to return and instructs her to name the son that she's pregnant with Ishmael which means God hears and in the story she says oh you're the God that sees me and so Dolores Williams uses her story as a way to show that even though God didn't necessarily change her situation and change her from being a slave, she did allow Hagar to recognize that God was with her and allowing and her being able to understand that is what gave her the encouragement to be able to go back to that situation having some type of hope. And so in her book, Williams talks about how for enslaved women, this was really important for people who um, were in the generation, you know, before 1865, before slavery in the United States ended, they didn't know what the future of their children held. And so being able to have that type of understanding of that story in Genesis 16 would give them hope that God was with them, even though they weren't sure when slavery in the United States would end. And I think the way Williams frames this is really important because she talks about how a lot of women is have a survivalist lens versus <laughs> going back to the word again liberation versus a liberationist lens and so a lot of women is like, like Williams look at the issue of how does God help people who are in oppressive situations 
build a quality of life in the midst of oppression versus how do we necessarily liberate people from systems of oppression, which is another end. And she makes it clear that a liberationist lens versus a survivalist lens, one isn't better than the other, but this is the lens that she prefers. How do we help people have hope in the midst of a situation that may not change or that may take a while to change? Yeah, now there's another level to what uh, Dolores Williams is doing in Sisters in the Wilderness in which he also engages in a critique of the Bible and the way the Bible presents the story. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that uh, this is one of the points. It's important to be able to parse the conversation. Right, right. And what I mean by that is, is that on the one hand, there are a series of observations here about Hagar, that God paid attention to Hagar, mm-hmm. that God cared for Hagar. God was aware of what Hagar and her situation and even elements of the injustice of it. Mm-hmm. And yet at the same time, she's saying, but he did instruct her to go back into a situation in which she was going to be a slave and be subservient. And and Dolores Williams is a little, uncom- uh, uh, is a little uncomfortable with that element of the Bible. And so what you see in the midst of some observations that are made that cause us to pay attention to things in the Bible we might skip over is also a handling of the Bible that allows some some a different kind of reflection that that puts the theme of liberation almost over what the Bible is doing if you're not careful. And so I, I have some quotes here from the book from Sisters in Wilderness that I'll just read that'll that'll show this this element which I'm being critical of. And that is engaging this hermeneutic um, women's hermeneutic also allows black theologians to see at what point they must be critical of the biblical text itself. Mm-hmm. In those instances where the text supports oppression, exclusion, even death of innocent people, she she talks about the way in which the Canaanites are seen in the Bible and how that's that's a negative that, that can't be embraced because of the way of the use of violence. And and I, I find myself I rem, I remember being in class in seminary when we were going through the Bible and the Pentateuch. Sorry, this is going so long, <laughs> but being and we were going through the Pentateuch and I was reading about the mm-hmm. the way the Bible was describing Canaanite culture. It was polytheistic. Um, there was child sacrifice, etc. There were a lot of things attached to Canaanite cu- culture that God was judging as Israel took the land, and and that that's not anywhere in anything that she's talking about, which is a part of what is going on in that passage, and that's important to what's going on. So that so that this this challenge of reading everything through the oppression lens or through the exclusion lens. Although it's important to be sensitive to those things when they're happening, um, can result in missing some of the things that the Bible is actually doing with the space, which yeah. is also important mm-hmm. to be aware of. Now I've gone long and hard, and and so I'm really ready for interaction with from <laughs> any of you about what I just did. Well, I just have a quick quip, uh-huh. and I want to say that one of the most profound and simplistic things that I have heard someone say here at DTS that has really helped shape my theology was actually Dr. Yarbrough, and he said, just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean that God endorsed right. it. Right. Mm-hmm. Placement and advocacy are not the same. I That's was going to say that. Right. And, yeah. it, and it was such a yeah. simplistic but important statement yeah. that we recognize what is part of the larger narrative, what God is doing with the larger narrative, where he is judging, where we're we're under a different mm-hmm. covenant, and, the, and you know, for some of this, this is really deep theology. But again, just sort of the macro narrative is here. Here is just because it's in Scripture doesn't mean that that's yeah. God's heart, and He endorses yeah. it. Mm-hmm. You know, it is part of a larger narrative, and we can't miss that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when we cease to think canonically or from the variety of angles that Scripture gives us, we may we may too quickly make the analogy and miss something that's going on right. in the way in which the associations are actually working biblically. Sandy, Sandra, you look like One of our challenges so. is to constantly think critically without becoming critics of everything, mm-hmm. right? right? And don't you think that that's how we should read any commentary, even if it's written from someone in our camp, mm-hmm. so to speak? I mean, it's part of reading outside of our camp to see some if, if you allow me that there isn't like there's really an in or an out, but yeah. you get what I'm saying. That, that uh, for example, the woman at the well, mm-hmm. there has been a tendency to just come to that and say, yeah, she's immoral. She had slept with all these guys and now she's shacking up with somebody. And then you go to some of the feminist scholars and they've done some really good work on the backgrounds and going, you know, she could have been in a polygamous situation. War is the number one killer of men. And that's the same phrase that's used for a concubine. Mm-hmm. And and then you go back to church history and find out there are a bunch of people in church history that didn't think she was immoral at all. And mm-hmm. in fact, that 
that Jesus has gone out of his way to see this vulnerable person who's widowed multiple times. And so we might reject a hermeneutic, but also appreciate observations that might come from a different socioeconomic status perspective, a different ethnicity perspective. And we need all eyes on the text, right? So we have to think critically, but also read widely and and recognize that we have our own blinders when we come to the text, that sometimes people outside of how we might see things are going to help us see things that we've missed because we don't even know what we don't see. Yeah, Shai, anything you want to add? Yeah, going off of what you were saying about your critique of Williams, I would mm-hmm. add to that for sure that I think that's one of my hesitancies with womanism is sometimes um, womanist scholars want to um, dismiss or look over stories in the Bible that they read as misogynistic. And just going back to what Christina said, we want to you know clarify that just because You know, there's, you know, the rape of Tamar in Genesis 34, which is obviously really unfortunate. And a lot of women as scholars, um, you know, don't even like that the story is in the Bible. And so it's really important that people understand the reason why something is in the Bible and not assuming that because it's there that the action or the event um, was supported. And so that's definitely a critique that I have of womanism that we don't want to omit or dismiss any part of the Bible, but we want to make sure that we're looking at it in the right way in terms of the context of the whole biblical narrative and not just issues that we might be facing today. Yeah. So uh, this this yeah. this raises, I, I think, the the point of the exercise of much of our conversation, which is that there are, there are blind spots that people have, and they when they read the scripture that are important, uh, they're important to to uh, recover from. That if I can we say have. that, that's exactly <laughs> right. right. Yeah, that everybody we has. Have. Yeah. That's right. Sometimes yeah. the only way I see those blind spots is by someone coming at the Bible from a completely right. different angle, and. And raising a, a biblical question for me that allows me to see, oh, you know what? I didn't, mm-hmm. I didn't notice that before. I haven't thought about that question. And of course, it's natural that if someone lives in a, in an, in an isolated or marginalized environment, they would be more sensitive to marginalizing passages right. Right. and the status right. of marginalized people than I might be having not experienced that marginalization to any right. great degree. I'm, and I know. I do know when I became sensitive to this. I became sensitive to this when I went to Germany on sabbatical, and I was operating in a second language, mm-hmm. which I only partially possessed. Okay, <laughs> yeah. which meant that there were things that I were think that I was thinking about what was going on around me that I couldn't adequately express to people around me necessarily. You lost nine tenths of your vocabulary. <laughs> exactly <laughs> right, and, and you yeah. know, and and I remember the very frustrating feeling of being in a what the equivalent of a PTA meeting, parents mm-hmm. meeting mm-hmm. at the school where my kids were going because we put them in German schools. Everything's going on in German and it's it's we, we had a phrase in our house that's Turbo Deutsch. And so, you know, so I mean the German was fast. The, yeah, the German was coming fast and furious and I'm just trying to keep up and understand and get my hands around, you know, things that are involving my kids. And I was recognizing, man, I'm I'm not only I'm not only culturally in some cases not understanding what's going on here, but I'm struggling to even understand what's being said and what that means for my kids, etc. And just the 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 disconnectedness that that created created for me through no fault in one sense of yeah. uh, of anyone it was just it was just the situation I found myself in and 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 then the next thought that came to me is that's how a lot of people live in our country mm-hmm. and um, and and I'm sitting here going. And so what can we do? So when so when we when my wife and I came into the PTA at Hillcrest, we spent a lot of time making sure that at least uh, a bilingual structure existed in the things that were being communicated mm-hmm. so that Latino parents in particular could could connect to what was going on with their kids, that kind of thing. So they weren't in the same position we were put in. And I'm just sitting here going, I think that's I think that's, that's fair. I think that's yeah. right. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think this is the point that you're trying to make, but just to say it more explicitly, it strikes me that that really, when we talk about these terms like womanism and feminism mm-hmm. or, you know, critical theories in general, that it is just culture trying to make sense of this world we live in and right. this fallen, broken right. world we live in. And, you know, it's not that there isn't overlap in language because I think the language that the church uses and that culture uses speaks to each other in a lot of ways. And again, you know, to as I said earlier, 
earlier, there are redemptive aspects of all of these movements and ideologies. Um, but I think that it, it compels me to give a little bit more grace to culture grasping to try to make sense. You know, I've got the end of the story. I know how this ends. I have a biblical picture, but not everybody does, mm-hmm. right? And so that really is, when we talk about all of these different terms, it is culture grasping to make sense of the world we live in. And in some cases, it's a grasping because there's not a hope that involves a fighting for territory and a fighting for recognition, a fighting not to be invisible, et cetera. And if you don't have that that identity, that solid identity base, which I think the gospel does offers to people, um, uh, th- then it, it makes it makes sense. I'm gonna I'm gonna be protective. I'm gonna be protective of when I'm since I'm being injured or my own are being injured, that kind of thing. And, and so, to understand that that sometimes where things are coming from, even with the frustration, the anger that often comes with it, because it's happened over a long period of time, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. And the injustices might be real. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly right. right. So right. Anger's a- inappropriate. A- a- exactly yeah, right. right. So there yeah. all those. So it's a much more mixed. It is bag of, right. of a fallen world in which I, I sometimes say that life in a fallen world are values that are out of whack, and so they're colliding. Mm-hmm. They're not aligned. Right. And mm-hmm. if you understand the world that way, it makes you, uh, in one sense, a little more patient with the struggle of trying to figure out what's going on mm-hmm. and, and how to talk to people about it, and particularly how to talk to people about it who may not who aren't approaching it the same way oftentimes you are and who may not have all the elements that they're not playing with the same elements that you are let's just say it that way mm-hmm. and all that's important in in the interaction that you have and in developing the interaction and i think one of the things that that means is it should turn us in one sense into better listeners Yes. Better listeners and better parsers. Listening on the one hand, but doing this kind of parsing that we did with the little exercise that we had earlier in which we say, I can value this. I can understand why someone would raise mm-hmm. this. This is important to see. But this part of it, I think I'm not sure I would go there in terms of trying to solve this problem or, or complete the assessment of it. I mentioned Genesis, but I don't want to end without mentioning Revelation. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that is some of what drives the desire for embracing ethnicity is coming right out of Revelation. Sure right? it is. And in the end, women and men are priests, mm-hmm. and they are we're family, we're brothers and sisters. And so it can be also living into the kingdom mm-hmm. to be doing what you and your wife did, right? Mm-hmm. You experiencing something and you saw, I want to do to others as I would have them do to me. Mm-hmm. Um, so sometimes I think it's a desire to make sense. Sometimes I think it's a legit desire to right a wrong. Um, and we might have very different reasons. A, mm-hmm. a, a radical feminist might hate pornography, mm-hmm. and I can hate pornography, mm-hmm. right? And and we can join forces even mm-hmm. if we have different rationales or different views of how this ends. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't necessarily mean I can't have anything to do with them or can't listen right. to them or partner with them because they – it's us and them. So – and because uh, – Revelation is a good place to kind of to land this plane because the other thing that's going on in Revelation that's also very clear is it's many tribes and many nations. Mm-hmm. And I tell people the church is a transnational entity. Yes. It is a uh, – or a pan-national entity, however you want to express it. And we're supposed – the church is supposed to be a sneak preview of where yes. we're headed. Yes. So yeah. how do you get there? And and what does that mean? And that that certainly is a core and biblical value. The whole point of redemption in its long run is to restore what was lost at the fall. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And in that restoration comes that cooperation, comes mm-hmm. that working together, comes that shared positive engagement and stewardship and effort to understand one another, all those kinds of things. So I see this as a very natural biblical um, landing point for all this. I mean, I, I like to I like to joke when I'm in Ephesians 2, maybe not joke, but actually have people think seriously about the passage. In the very passage where I get it's clear that salvation is by grace, it's not by mm-hmm. works. The very next point that's made is, in Christ we're all one new man. And, and, and Christ is about the business of reconciliation. He says, we've been created for good works, and the first good work that he has on display for us is this reconciled work between formerly estranged people, these two groups that are called Jews and Gentiles, okay? Yeah. It's not race, but it's similar. Mm-hmm. And these two estranged groups now brought together, and God says, 
you're going to get along, <laughs> and you're going to get what? along. The team you're going to get, get along, along. and the reason you can get along is because you all share the same need you're for me. You're even going to love each other. That's exactly right. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's extremely important yeah. in thinking about this space and the challenges of it. So we got a couple of minutes left. I'm going to let you each say one thing. So the, what's the one thing you haven't said that you wish – you could say as we think about this topic, and I'm just going to start with you, Christina. Okay, well, that's a lot of pressure. But I, <laughs> one of the things I was thinking about as you were speaking, Sandra, is that I don't want to lose sight of you know, there's there's a way to engage within the church, but that there is still common grace and common good yeah. outside of the church yes. too. And that is what allows us to engage culture in a way that is winsome and compassionate, not compromising, but still very compelling and leads people to Christ. And so sometimes I think we can become unintentionally so us versus them, mm-hmm. you know, and then you know, really you parse it out and you're like, who's the us and who's the them? Right. It gets very mm-hmm. murky because the truth is it's not an us versus them. There is the church and there is is the lost, but one of the ways we engage them is through that common grace, working towards the common good. And and so it's not an exclusivity to this is how the church engages feminism. There is actually a way to engage culture without losing your biblical values that is winsome. Right. Sandra? Um, I would say there are good and bad things about feminism and womanism, right? Mm-hmm. And, and we can embrace the good. And uh, and reject what isn't healthy. And I think rather than, if I were going to apply it in a church situation, I would say if you come in, you men and women alike seeing there are gender injustices happening here. Instead of how can we promote one or the other, is what would it look like for us to partner? Do we have a missions committee that has men and women on it? Mm-hmm. Are our greeters men and women? Mm-hmm. If somebody comes down to the front to respond to an altar call in churches that still do, are there men and women down there? Mm-hmm. Uh, so that we are modeling what it looks like to love one another deeply from the heart. We have the best message for doing that. We, of all people, should be able to not be sexualizing relationships, to be modeling what it looks like to love one another and work together as brothers and sisters, partnering. Cheyenne? Um, last thing I'll say is that I think sometimes when we have these conversations, there is a lot of conversation about identity placement and how do people see their race and their gender um, in light of their faith. And I think one thing I want people to take away from this conversation, particularly as it relates to black feminism and womanism, is that um, you know the Bible does support the socio-political and economic welfare of black women as image bearers um, of God and that upholding the Bible and supporting black women is not mutually exclusive. Mm-hmm. Um, that going back to what you said earlier about justice, that is a part of the biblical definition of justice. But I think it's our job as Christians to do a better job of parsing that out. And sometimes we don't do a great job of that. Yeah, in fact, the only way to parse it out sometimes is to have those conversations, do some listening, hear about someone's different experience, and actually. Uh, not just react, but take it in and 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 process what it is that's being said. Because um, oftentimes, I find in the conversations I have with people of different ethnic backgrounds, their nature of their experience and what they've been through is very different than what I've been through. Uh, and that's not to elevate experience, but it is to say that experience can define people. Yeah. What happens to people sure. can yeah. impact people, yeah. and to be aware of that can be very, very important. Experience is story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly right. So I, I, I want to thank you all for taking the time to do this with us. We've been asking the question, feminism and versus womenism, or feminism and womenism, what's the difference, and, and what difference does it make? And I think you've helped us uh, think through that, so I appreciate it. And we thank you for being a part of the table. We hope you'll join us again soon. If you want to look at other uh, episodes of the table of the podcast, you can go to voice.dts.edu slash table podcast, and you can find the whole menu of the variety of things that we do on the table, and we hope you'll join us again soon. Thanks for listening to the table podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.